Hi, my name is Janet Anderson, and I am the chairperson of the Westboro Community Land Trust Education Committee. Uh, welcome. We are having a Zoom talk today by Gary Kessler on a few days in the Galapagos. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about the Westboro Community Land Trust. Our mission is to protect open space in Westboro, and we also maintain many miles of trails in town so that people can enjoy the open space that we have. And we also put on monthly uh, events, usually walks, occasionally talks like this one. And you are welcome to learn more about these events at our website, westborolandtrust.org. And that's Westboro spelled with the O-U-G-H. Um, I will just highlight a few that are coming up. We are currently in the last week of our amateur photography competition. If you're interested in entering a, photograph, uh, a photograph that was taken in the last year, you can do so by going to the, the website. And there are wonderful prizes, so please consider that. Also, we are having... Um, a wildflower hunt coming up starting in March. Uh, we will be posting uh, pictures mm -hmm. of wildflowers that have been found in the past in Westboro throughout um, spring and summer. They will be going up monthly and the public is invited to find examples of those wildflowers in Westboro, take a picture and post it and tell us where you found it. It's, it's a way to help us inventory the wildflowers while also providing you some fun to hunt for something in the woods with your family, which should be great. Um, and the most important event that we have coming up, in my opinion, is uh, on the week of April 10th to 17th, we have the Earth Day litter cleanup, which we strongly encourage everyone who lives, works, or enjoys Westboro to help out with. It's our big event of the year. It's your chance to give back. And there will be an online sign up this year, no in-person event, unfortunately due to obvious reasons. And um, as we did last year, there will be an online sign up. Um, again, go to westborolandtrust.org and that will be open from April 1st to 9th. And you can choose an area to clean and the bags will be dropped off on your doorstep. You will have a week to clean the area from April 10th to the 17th. And you leave the bags by the road and the DPW picks them up and it's just, a wonderful way to give back without having to be at any risk of being in a large group. So please consider helping us out. So tonight's event is uh, a few days in the Galapagos um, put on by Gary Kessler. Gary is a long-term uh, resident of Westboro, a long-term member of the Westboro Community Land Trust and a renowned, well, at least locally renowned wildlife photographer, extremely, extremely good wildlife photographer. And we're very lucky that he volunteered to put this talk on for us tonight. He went to the Galapagos Islands in 2018 as what's a bucket list trip, something he'd been wanting to do all of his life and finally got to do with his wife, Annie. Um, and we are lucky enough to be able to vicariously travel with him on that trip. And so welcome to all of you and welcome to Gary Kessler and I will turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Janet. So as Janet indicated, most but not all of the pictures are ones that I took on our trip out there in 2018. A few of them were actually taken by my brother who had visited some of the islands a couple of years earlier. And when he visited, um, they went to a few of the other islands um, and saw a couple of things there that we didn't see when we visited. And you'll actually see that one of the pictures came off the internet so much for full disclosure. The Galapagos are basically on the equator and they're 600 miles off the Ecuadorian coast um, out here in the Pacific. And there are 19 islands, there are over 100 small islets and a multitude of small rocks on the stick out of the ocean. The islands are volcanic. The largest, Isabella, which is this thing over here, um, is actually six volcanoes that have fused together. And the Western islands like Isabella are actually still active. Our, our visit was to um, Santa Cruz Island and 
on the area surrounding it, which is kind of in the northeastern part of the archipelago. And there are two ways that you can get to the Galapagos. Um, one is that you can get there by boat. The other is that you can fly in. Um, touring by boat has the advantage that the boat can move around at night going from island to island while you're asleep. Um, however, we flew into the airport, which is here on Baltra, and um, we were ferried across the channel here, um, and we stayed in the middle of Santa Cruz. Um, and from there, we would basically drive to either the channel to get a boat um, or um, to the coast um, on our day trips. Um, a couple of things, um, presumably you folks can see an island up here, it's obscured for me, um, which is um, North Seymour Island, which is one of the places that we'll visit. This little speck over here um, is actually Daphne Major, which we'll talk about. And down here, um, hard to see, um, is North and South Plaza Island, another location that we'll visit. So a few rules before we move on about visiting the islands. Number one, the only thing that goes into or out of the islands is you and your luggage. The plane that we used is sprayed with insecticide when we left the mainland. Um, special attention was given to the overhead compartments and the luggage compartments. They wanna make sure that nothing goes into that island that isn't already there. Um, and while you're on the island, you're basically always with guides. Um, you stay on the paths, you don't wander off. Um, the environment is actually fragile. It sees a lot of visitors each year and it takes a long time to recover if it's damaged. There's no collecting and they really do mean no collecting. I was pulled aside in the airport waiting to leave because I had a rock in my luggage. Um, it was something I'd actually gotten on the mainland, and it was obviously not something collected on the island. But they made me fish it out of my luggage so that they could see what it was. When they saw what it was, um, it clearly wasn't a problem, and they let me go. But they do check. They really do mean it. No collecting. Um, so... We actually saw our first Galapagos animal in the inside the airport terminal. Um, this is actually outside, but we saw the same thing inside. It's a painted locust and it's an endemic species. Endemic means it's only found on the Galapagos Islands. This is the channel um, that we crossed and we went to almost daily. Um, to get boats. And our first look at one of the iconic birds of the islands was crossing the channel um, to get from the airport to our hotel. This is a blue-footed booby. Blue-footed boobies are endemic subspecies. Again, endemic means it's only on the islands. Subspecies, however, means it's an isolated population from other populations. So there are other populations of blue-footed boobies, but the blue-footed boobies in the Galapagos keep to themselves. They don't mix with other blue-footed boobies. You can find blue-footed boobies all the way along the coast from northern Mexico to southern Peru. But if you want to see the Galapagos blue-footed booby, you have to go to the islands. It's kind of like an isolated race or tribe. These are scalatia trees. Along the way to the hotel, um, we stopped for a little bit of sightseeing to stretch our legs. Um, their more colloquial name is dandelion trees or sometimes daisy trees. And that's because they're related to dandelions and daisies, which are in the aster family. So that little thing that grows in your yard and is kind of a pain in the neck, this is the big daddy. It's endemic. 
Um, again, means it's only found on the islands. The largest of these tend to grow um, on the eastern islands. Um, they grow in relatively uniformly aged stands um, in the humid windward side of the island group. There are many varieties of these. They have various microclimates that they've adapted to. The ones that you see here are among the largest varieties. Our first reptile, we'll see a few reptiles on the islands. Um, this is a female lava lizard. It's another endemic species. The orange color of this female signals that she's um, receptive to mating. This is the male. Looks a little different. Um, an interesting thing about lava lizards is that if they're threatened, they can actually change color as a threat response. That one was relatively calm. So, full warning. This is the biology lesson part. You can't really visit the Galapagos without some discussion of Darwin and evolution. This is the uninhabited island of Daphne Major. And it's the site of what started as a two-year study of evolutionary processes by Peter and Rosemary Grant. That study ultimately became a 40-year commitment as they returned year after year to continue the study. Now, consider their dedication as we look at the edge of the island here. As you can see, it gently slopes down into the water, not. About the only place that you can probably get up onto the island is here. And even after you get up there, um, you still have to hike on up to where they were camping. And the slopes of this are really pretty steep. So this really wasn't for the faint of heart. And back when they were started their study, you know, they were fairly young, not long out of grad school. But after 40 years, I would imagine that this was a little bit of exercise. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on geology, um, but this is a volcanic tuff cone. Now, tuff cones are an interesting formation. They form when superheated magma rises underneath the ocean and it hits the, the seawater and it explodes on contact. And this continuous process builds and builds and builds until this cone rises above the surface um, and continues to build over time. A grant chose this island because it's ideal for researching evolutionary processes. It's isolated, it's never been inhabited. So any changes that they would see would be the result of natural processes and not human intervention. The weather on the island is subject to extreme variations from year to year, providing for changing conditions that the plants and then the animals need to tolerate and respond to. One group of those animals that the grants focused on were Darwin's finches. They're a good subject because they were plentiful, still are. They're easy to catch don't run from people very much, and they could record the measurements for them. Their initial observation of the finches was that the smaller finches, um, such as this small ground finch, were the most plentiful. These smaller ground finches feed on softer shells that their smaller bills can crack. Um, it's not that easy to distinguish some of the, the various Darwin finches of which there are many. Um, but one of the things that you can focus on is the bill. So as we look at some of these finches, you'll notice that this has a relatively small, um, sharp, pointy bill. Um, this is a small tree finch, another one of the small Darwin finches, um, has a different bill shape, as you can see. Um, and they're also plentiful um, throughout the area. After a few years, there was a year of extreme drought and the softer seed supply became scarce. Many of the small finches 
that we were looking at died off in subsequent years, um, the medium finches, like this medium crowned finch here, see the bill is a little bit heftier, a little different shape, um, they could eat the tougher seeds and they became more common. A few years later, a new larger bird appeared on the island, similar to this bird here, um, had a much heftier bill. Um, this is actually a large ground finch. Um, the Grants actually nicknamed these larger birds Big Bird, no relation to uh, the one that became a television star. Um, and these large birds, they could eat both the large seeds and the small seeds, as well as nectar and pollen and seeds of prickly pear cactus, which were on the island, which we'll see in a while. Um, the interesting thing about this big bird was that its descendants only mated with themselves generation after generation. You might recall from high school biology, if you're as old as I am, um, that that was one of the characteristics of speciation. Several years later, there was an El Nino, which brought some heavy rains. And again, the seed supply changed, but this time the seed shifted from large hard to crack seeds to many different types of small, softer seeds. Um, the medium finches, um, like this one shown here, um, gave these birds with smaller bills than the the large finches, an advantage um, when another drought hit the following year. The small beaked finches could eat all the small seeds faster than the large beaked finches could get to them. Um, they're a bit more agile. The large finch, and yet later years, there was another drought. And by this time, the population of large ground finches was well established on the island. These large ground finches were in competition for the large, tougher seeds that were also part of the medium ground finches diet. Unlike the earlier drought, the one that we talked about at the very beginning, when all of the small ground finches had a die off, this time it was the medium finches that prevailed. Um, this time, oh, sorry. This time it was the medium finches um, that had difficulty um, and the adverse effects of food competition from the large ground finches proved too much for the medium finch population. So there are three main takeaways from the grant study um, that are worth pointing out. First, natural selection is variable. It's a constantly changing process early on um, it was the medium finches um, that prevailed. Later on, it was the medium finches that declined. Next, evolution can actually be a fairly rapid process. Once upon a time, we were taught that it was a very slow process taking place in geologic time through the fossil record. But here you can see that it took place over a short period of years. And finally, perhaps most significantly, what gets selected changes over time. So to quote Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. So let's proceed with our tour of the islands. The Galapagos flycatcher is endemic to the islands. It resembles our much larger gray crested flycatcher with its gray crest, um, it has white chest, yellow belly, um, it looks a lot like um, its older cousin. Um, our great crested flycatchers are a medium sized bird. If you're used to seeing backyard birds, it's about the size of a cardinal. Um, the Galapagos flycatcher, however, is much smaller. It's about the size of a titmouse. Another familiar looking bird if you happen to be a birder in Westboro, um, is the Galapagos subspecies of the yellow warbler. This particular colony of yellow warblers is endemic to the islands, meaning it doesn't mix with yellow warblers outside the islands. But 
It does behave much like the yellow warblers that we see nesting here in Westboro each summer. Um, it skulks through the underbrush, stalking tasty insects. American flamingos um, can be found on the islands, but they're not endemic. Rather, they come and go as they see fit. Same is true for a number of shorebirds that migrate through the area. Um, this wimpro um, is a long distance migrant. Um, they've been known to fly 2,500 miles from the southern end of Canada or here in New England, all the way to the tip of South America, sometimes making um, extraordinary long distance flights over open ocean. This is a wandering tattler. We don't tend to see them on the East Coast. This is a Pacific Coast shorebird. It's called wandering um, because it has a wide range over the ocean. And it's called a tattler um, because it has a loud alarm call um, that it makes when it warns of humans, um, which annoys hunters to no end. We have oyster catchers that come through our beaches um, in the summertime. The Galapagos oyster catcher, however, is an endemic subspecies. This is a ruddy turnstone. It's another bird um, that we see on our shores um, sometimes in the summertime. Um, it's called a turnstone because it will use its, its bill to flip over um, shells and little rocks and stuff along the rack line as it looks for insects. So it's an interesting foraging technique. Sally Lightfoot crabs are found all along the Pacific coast, coast from Mexico southward. Um, this dark form here is a juvenile um, and it blends in better with the volcanic rocks as you can see. Adults are much flashier but they're hard to catch. Um, they can run in all four directions, um, turn on a dime, and they can even climb vertical walls. Another look at these things, they really stand out against the dark rocks. Much of the environment um, is harsh and spare. This is a view of some of the lusher vegetation on South Plaza Island which is just east of, east of Santa Cruz, where we were staying. Now, to the north of Santa Cruz is Baltra. And that's where the airport is. And north of that is North Seymour Island. And we got our first looks at the iconic land lizards, land iguanas of the Galapagos on North Seymour. Um, the land iguanas um, vary in size from island to island. Um, the ones on North Seymour are among the smallest. Um, they can be up to three feet long, about 30 pounds. Some of the other islands, they can be up to five feet long and uh, more like about probably 50 pounds. They're attracted to yellow. Um, not only are they yellow, but the cactus flowers that they like to eat are yellow. Um, and wearing a pair of yellow sneakers and yellow socks will gain you a friend for the duration of your visit. But being endemic, you don't have to worry, they won't follow you home. A little closer look at Uh, land iguanas are one kind of large iguana that's found on the islands. Um, the marine iguanas are another iconic species um, and they are absolutely unique to the Galapagos. They're the only ocean going lizard in the world. There are a few others um, that go into freshwater. Um, there's one I think in Thailand um, in the rivers, um, but this is the only one that goes into the ocean. They're thought to have actually evolved from the land iguanas. 
um, and they have a number of adaptations for life on the coastal rocks and in the water. Besides being the color of the rocks, they have large claws for climbing, holding on in the surf, and flat tailed when hand swimming. Um, their faces are flattened as well, um, as you can see here, relative to the land iguanas. And this makes it easier for them to browse vegetation off the rocks while they're underwater. Um, here you can see they, they really do have substantial claws. It's a little hard to see the flattening of their, their tails. So despite the equatorial location of the Galapagos, um, the harsh environment um, is often a cactus desert um, with prickly pear forest. Now, it always sort of strikes me as odd to see cactus in the middle of the ocean, but cactus flowers are an important food source for some of the birds, like the, there's a cactus finch, some of the reptiles, like the land iguanas, and also the giant tortoises. An interesting factoid about the flowers is that the anthers, these things here, um, are actually touch sensitive and they'll curl to deposit their, their pollen um, on whatever it is that disturbs them. This allows them to deposit pollen on insects and birds that come to visit the flowers. But it also allows them to self-pollinate when the wind jostles them right away. Um, and there are another cactus in the area. There are about 200 species of prickly pear in the world. Um, one even grows on Cape Cod. Of the 200, about six are thought to have reached the Galapagos. Of those six, um, they evolved into a about 14 species as they adapted, or to say it another way, as they were selected by um, not only the harsh island environments, but also the effects of predation. So for example, giant tortoises eat prickly pear leaves. Um, where there are giant tortoises, the prickly pears are tall like this one, where there isn't predation from giant tortoises and the iguanas, um, the prickly pears are shorter. Now, being 600 miles out in the Pacific at the intersection of three nutrient-rich ocean currents, there's a rich variety of seabirds around the islands. This wedge-rumped, excuse me, wedge-rumped storm petrel has an interesting way of fishing. It appears to dance on the surface of the ocean. Um, it's actually tapping the surface with its toes to attract minnows to the surface, which it then snatches up as they rise to the sound. Um, the wedge-rumped um, storm petrel um, is an en another endemic subspecies. There are both great frigate birds and magnificent frigate birds found on the islands. Um, they're similar in size and shape. It's hard to tell them apart. But one way you can do that is by the sheen on their feathers. Um, this one has a green sheen. You can sort of see it here. And that makes it a great frigate bird. The males attract females by inflating this bright red throat sac. Um, and when the pairs bond, they're monogamous for the season. But the season can be up to two years long as it takes that long to raise a chick. Frigate birds skim the ocean surface um, looking for their prey, um, a favorite of flying fish as they pop out of the ocean. But as you can see, they're not the only ones that pursue um, a meal near the surface. Here we have an irresistible male on display. The chicks can take up to six months before they're ready to fledge. This blue-footed booby um, has its own way to display. They are renowned for their courtship ritual. That's when the male will dance with the female 
alternately picking up and showing one foot and then showing her the other foot, um, kind of like doing the holy gully. Of the five species of booby on the islands, only the blue-footed booby is an endemic subspecies. There's a study that looked into um, the color, the foot color, in relation to the health of the chicks. And it found that the healthiest chicks tended to have the fathers with the most intensely blue feet. Possibly this is an indication of the superior ability of the father to keep himself well fed. And the females might prefer such males as mates um, since there would be superior providers for the chicks. Blue-footed boobies um, have anywhere from one to three chicks in a brood and both parents care for the young. Obviously, this one has one. Um, nests are basically scrapes in the ground. Um, other of the boobies are the Nazca boobies. Um, they like to nest um, near cliffs um, on unvegetated outcrops. And we have a graceful display by one of the Nazca boobies. There are also red-footed boobies, which are the smallest of the boobies. The waved albatross is the only albatross in the tropics. The shape of their wings allows them to soar for hours, but also makes them awkward during takeoff and landing. They're long-lived, living up to 40 years. They breed primarily on one island in the Galapagos, Española which is in the southeastern part of the archipelago. Every year, the entire population of waved albatrosses returns to that island between April and December. Their numbers have been declining and they're listed as critically endangered. The Galapagos hawk is among the world's rarest hawks with only about 150 breeding pairs known. Among their prey are those painted locusts that we saw earlier and the lava lizards. Galapagos hawks have a somewhat unique breeding system. Males are monogamous, but females are promiscuous mating with several males throughout the season. And then all the males share their rearing duties, spreading the work among them. Yellow crowned night heron is an endemic subspecies. Um, we also see them um, here in Massachusetts in our wetlands in the summertime, but we don't see this particular subspecies. Another familiar wetland bird in Massachusetts are great blue herons, but again, the islands have their own endemic subspecies. Red billed tropic birds nest on the cliffs of some of the islands. Here you can see the long tail of the tropic bird. A little more geology, these basalt columns are evidence of the volcanic nature of the islands. They're formed as magma cools. And what happens is the magma cools from the surface, which would be at one point maybe here, on downward. Um, and as it cools, um, it contracts and one of the best packing forms, geometries, which you used to find in your egg cartons and still find in honeycombs, is a hexagonal form. And so it cracks with these hexagonal plates that extend on down as the magma cools following these hexagonal columns. And so now you know a little bit about basalt columns. This is, um, I think, part of either North or South Plaza Island. Um, and it pretty clearly is another geologic process, which is uplift of sedimentary rocks um, from the ocean floor. But again, the islands are primarily volcanic. This is a striated heron, which is another of the heron 
and it's taken up permanent residence and become an endemic subspecies. It's also known as a lava heron um, because its dark plumage blends right in with the rocks. Now I promised prickly pear forest, and here is prickly pear forest on South Plaza Island, um, which does have predation from um, the land iguanas. There are both sea lions and fur seals that are found in the Galapagos. These are Galapagos sea lions, which inhabit the islands, um, and also one small island just off the Ecuadorian coast. And because of that one small island, um, they're not considered to be endemic, but if you were to include that island, they're endemic to that group of islands off, off Ecuador. Um, they're particularly fond of South Plaza Island, but they're found throughout the Galapagos. Now, in a harem, there's only one alpha male, and the alpha male um, tends to be in the nursery guarding the pups as they play. And you can see his duties aren't always carefree. Fur seals are an endemic species to the Galapagos. Um, they're hard to distinguish visually um, from the sea lions. Um, here you can see, sorry. This is a um, still a sea lion pup. And what I was about to say is here you can see one of the distinguishing characteristics of the fur seals. And that is these longer front flippers. Um, this is again a pup. Um, don't be fooled by the color. That's not a distinguishing characteristic, although this pup is clearly quite blonde. Um, and here you can sort of make out the front flippers, even though it's a different angle of a pup of a sea lion, and they're clearly shorter than the fur seals. Now, various animals have small differences as you move from island to island. For example, the marine iguanas um, on South Plaza are considerably smaller than the ones on Santa Cruz. Um, their heads are smaller and rounder, and the dorsal spines along their back are much less pronounced um, and rounder. Here's a close up of one. You can see just how foreshortened the face is on these guys. A little closer. Good look at about all of the dorsal spines that this one has. They just don't run down the back they do, like they do on some other islands. Fork tailed gulls are endemic to the Galapagos. They breed mainly on the islands. Um, they're the only fully nocturnal gull in the world. They prey on small fish and squid that rise in the night um, to feed on plankton. Their large dark eyes are specially adapted for night vision. Um, here, the black plumage on the head and the red eye ring indicates that the bird is in, blue, in breeding season. Males and females look the same, so can't tell you which sex it is. It gets hot all along the equator. So while nesting birds here tend to be sitting on their eggs to warm them for incubation, it's not uncommon to see them standing over their nests um, to keep the eggs cool. This pair is guarding their chick um, in the shade of a small um, bush um, to keep it out of the hot sun, but also away from the prying eyes of predators. Land iguanas vary a bit from island to island. The one on South Plaza have more prominent dorsal spines um, and they kind of are smooth to edge, the spines are. They don't have the stacked disc-like structure of the land iguanas that we signed on North Seymour. Um, 
Here's a North Timor land iguana. You can see here, almost looks like a set of stacked discs on the dorsal spines. Again, South Plaza, very smooth. Prickly pear is the main food source for the land iguanas. Um, note, all the pads have been taken off the lower parts of the prickly pear trees. This is another of Darwin's finches. It's the cactus finch. Um, this female appears to be investigating potential nest sites in a prickly pear tree. Here we have one that's feeding on nectar and pollen. They're quite adept at moving around um, on the spiny plants, actually standing on a flower. In the afternoon, um, we'd hit a swimming hole on the way home. This one was kind of interesting. You can see this green color um, in this little cove um, cut off from the main ocean. Now, I didn't attempt any underwater photography, but the marine life along the equator, where you've got these three ocean currents coming together is just breathtaking. Here you see the reflection of that green pool on this brown pelican as it flew on by us. This is a better look at what a brown pelican looks like. Um, it's an, yet another endemic subspecies. You find brown pelicans all along the Pacific. Um, they're off the California coast. This is the other of the frigate birds, a magnificent frigate bird. Um, it's just a bit larger than the great frigate bird. But like the great frigate bird, it too is an endemic subspecies. The brown noddy um, is a tropical seabird in the tern family. It's the largest of the noddies. During courtship, they nod to each other, hence it's called a noddy. Um, it's known to perch on the head of pelicans, waiting for the pelican to drop a minnow, um, which it then will steal. Um, as a medium-sized bird, um, the noddy is a bit large for this, and it looks quite odd um, when it's perched thusly. Galapagos penguin um, is endemic. It's the only penguin found in the northern hemisphere. You might recall I said the, the islands straddle the equator and the pelicans are found um, just north of the equator. All other pelicans are found in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the rarest of the pe pe penguins, I keep saying pelican, penguins, um, and it's endangered with a population of about uh, 1,500. It's found primarily along the Western face, facing shorelines where the cooler currents provide the most suitable habitat. Now this is a map of the hotel that we were staying in, in the center of Santa Cruz. I'm not showing it to you so that you can become familiar with um, the layout of the hotel. Um, I don't really know what kind of tree um, the wood is from, but I can tell that it's an equatorial species. And I can tell this because there aren't any growth rings. Really prominent here. You can see these rays you can see some splits, um, but it really doesn't have growth rings. With only one season all year round, there are some trees that have no annual cycle. Um, they grow uniformly throughout the year. Now, around the hotel, Darwin's finches provide ample opportunity to study adaptability. So for example, this small ground finch Remember the smaller, more pointy bill? Okay, 
It's sitting on the water cooler just outside the dining hall door. And it's waiting patiently to go in as soon as the dining hall opens. Now, perhaps it's learned this by watching the guests or perhaps by watching the medium ground finches that mob the hall at dining time. Either way, although we were actually always very well fed, it pays for the finches to be early to the dinner table. Smooth Bill's Ani um, was most likely deliberately introduced by local farmers sometime in the 1960s. A few years earlier, ticks had been accidentally brought to the islands with a batch of cattle. There was cattle farming on the islands and one of those islands was Santa Cruz. Um, this the tick infestation quickly became a heavy infestation and it resulted in many cattle dying. Um, having seen Ani's feeding on ticks in continental South America, it's thought that the farmers released some on Isabella on the western side of the islands, the largest of the islands. However, over the next 50 years, the birds spread to all but one of the major islands and reached an estimated population of a quarter of a million of smooth billed Ani's. As you might expect, the short story of this is not only did the Ani's not control the ticks, but this worked out badly with adverse impacts to endemic species and enhanced spread of invasive plants. There are over 5,000 kinds of passion flowers in the world. Um, this particular white passion flower is native to the Galapagos and is the official flower of the islands. It's usually prolific. Where you find one, you usually find more. So having found this blossom, I searched for a more perfect example, but this was the only blossom I could find. However, my search was rewarded. This is the woodpecker finch, which is another of Darwin's finches. And it's so named because it will peck at the branches as it forages for insects. Interestingly, it also will make and use tools to extract insects from their hiding places. Um, some of these objects uh, might be a twig or a cactus spine, which it will use. Here you can see that this one was thoroughly inspecting several clumps of lichen and moss in the branches as it searched for insects. While woodpecker finches are reasonably common on Santa Cruz, this was only the second one I saw when we were there. East Coast monarch butterflies are known for their multi-generational long distance migration from Canada to Mexico. Um, we'd seen monarchs on the mainland in Ecuador, which we thought was south of their expected range. Um, and in fact, I've since learned that they are even farther south along the Western South American coast. Um, this butterfly, however, is 600 miles out to sea. So you might wonder, how did it get there? Um, is it resident? It's just moving through? No one actually knows but it is thought that it became resident after milkweed was introduced to the islands. Now, perhaps the most iconic of the many unique species in the Galapagos are the giant tortoises. At one time, there were more than a dozen different species spread across the islands. All are now threatened and a couple have actually gone extinct. We visited the giant tortoises on a what was a cattle farm in the highlands of Santa Cruz. Um, this particular species is characterized by its large dome shell um, where the shell is higher um, than its head. I was also distracted by this uh, well-patterned Galapagos dove another endemic species that likes to hang around the buildings um, at the farm. Being a cattle ranch, the field had, uh, the fields had foraging cattle egrets. We see cattle egrets from time to time on farms in Massachusetts. 
There are actually two distinct populations of giant tortoises on Santa Cruz. The larger Western population, which this is in the highlands, and a smaller Eastern population. Um, the Eastern, popu Eastern population is a newly named species. Um, and as a newly named species, we're able to focus our efforts to protect and restore the population better. It's basically it's naming of a species makes it easier to raise money for its preservation. Um, this tortoise, even the, the highland species, um, is more populous, but as you can see on this dark shell, the faded water line um, from its last mud wallow, one of their favorite things to do. Among various species of giant tortoises, the shape of the front of the shell varies considerably. Um, some have high arching shells in front here. Um, and that's to better reach vegetation. Others like this one, where lower vegetation is plentiful, have this flatter profile that you see. And yes, they really are big. And no, you're really not allowed to touch them. And it just looks like I am. These little flycatchers, Galapagos flycatcher, they were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. Um, but then what cattle farm doesn't have a lot of flies? Galapagos mockingbird is the most common of four mockingbird species endemic to the Galapagos. As I said, a favorite pastime. Now, the tortoises, um, they will generously share their wallows with a few privileged species. Um, here we see one of the highly invasive touristas. Um, the common gallon mule is a little more welcome, um, as are these white-cheeked pintails. There are actually three races or subspecies of white-cheeked pintails. This one, which is endemic to the Galapagos, there's another um, in the Caribbean, and there's a third in South America. There's really nothing like a good facial for the complexion. Santa Cruz is home to the Darwin Research Center, where an important undertaking is conservation of giant tortoises through research and braiding programs. But before we got there, we had to walk through this gauntlet of marine iguanas. And I had mentioned earlier that they are a little bit different on island to island, um, and that on South Plaza, where they were smaller, that these dorsal sp spines were much smaller. You can see these are much more prominent. The medium crown finches are absolutely everywhere. At the research station, um, there are breeding pens with baby tortoises. You notice the shape here in the, just over the neck. Can't tell you which particular species this is, but it's not one um, of the South Plaza um, or rather the uh, Santa Cruz giant tortoises. These are even younger um, and perhaps a different species, it's hard to be sure. Just another look. This little marking is um, a tag that the researchers put on for ID. Yeah, everybody has a comment to make, but not everybody's interested. 
Here we have an example of one of the species with that high arch to the shell. So this would have been from one of the islands um, with the taller vegetation. And there are disagreements from time to time. And we'll just do another quick look at some of the species. Glucose flycatchers, those yellow warblers. This is actually a cactus finch. As you can see, popcorn brings out all sorts. It gets hard to tell, but I would call this a medium ground finch, not a large ground finch. And there's really a lot to do in the Galapagos. It's not clear that you could ever spend enough time to do and see everything. And with that, um, if Chris wants to open it up, if there are any questions. First of all, thanks, Gary. That was fantastic. Um, so I'd say for the crowd, we have a pretty good crowd, um, which means just uh, yelling out your questions might not work. So why don't we say there's there's a few ways that you can get my attention to ask a question. You can write it in the chat or just write in the chat that you have a question. Um, there's also, you should have a little button on the bottom of your screen that says reactions, where you can raise your hand and that will also get my attention um, so, so we can call on you. Um, there was an early question uh, from uh, Michelle N. Um, and, and I'll just ask it because it, it, it's, it's uh, very straightforward. Uh, on slide number one of the, the turtle, there were these um, uh, unusual slots in the upper portion of the turtle's open mouth. Um, do you know anything about those, their function, what they are? I don't. Um, I think it's just turtle anatomy. Yeah, turtle anatomy. Uh, Jody, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Chris, do you have people to muted? Uh, people should be. Hello. There we go. Um, just wanted to know what surprised you most about the islands or the wildlife. Anything surprised you that you didn't know before you got there or that really um, stimulated your your um, intellect? Actually, it was the prickly pear trees, um, which we saw shortly after getting there, that I was not prepared for. Um, I wasn't really that aware of the nature of the environment of the islands. And so it was mm -hmm. surprising to find this forest with these giant prickly pear trees. Mm. And then to learn about their relationship um, with the other parts of the ecology of the islands, the birds and the, the reptiles um, was particularly interesting as well, not something I was expecting. Thank you. Fascinating talk, really well done. Thank you. I've got a general question, Gary. And um, you, you spoke at length in the beginning about how much effort it takes to preserve the diversity of uh, flora and fauna on the Galapagos. Um, and, and, and I also know that you have spent a lot of time um, uh, keeping abreast of the diversity locally in town where we don't spend nearly as much effort. And I, I wonder if, if you could give us your view of um, whether we're losing diversity locally, where that's happening. Is, that, is it flora, fauna, both? Well, that's kind of a 
a loaded question, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start by saying I by no means am an expert. And my experience is simply the experience of having lived in town um, and you know, gone to some of our open spaces um, over the last four decades. Mm -hmm. um, I also sort of grew up in New England, but not in Westboro. And there have been a lot of changes over that period of time. With regards to Westboro specifically, we've lost some diversity in my opinion. Um, and I think um, some of it, I don't think we know really why. Um, some of the, the plants like the wildflowers um, seem to have been in decline over a long period of time. Um, I know deer get accused of being one of the causes. Um, deer like our environment as we're building houses. It's actually ideal deer habitat and stuff. So the deer population has gone up. Um, I know there are other things, some of the birds, for example. Um, Audubon says that bird populations in our area have declined maybe 30%, um, just to use a number. Um, but there are other bird populations that have either come back or come into our area over time. Um, I think um, Carolina wren is a population um, that's come in. Um, I think cardinals might actually be one. I know blur birds are more plentiful than they were um, many decades ago, just to give some examples. Um, I do look at butterflies. There are changes in butterfly populations um, that we see. It appears that more northern species may be receding north. Um, some southern populations have come in. A recent example of that are giant swallowtails. Folks can Google them on the internet. It is the largest butterfly in our area. Um, and it has been in Westboro, I think, for less than 10 years, um, most recently and stuff. So yeah, there are a lot of changes that are happening. Um, some of them are because of us. Some of them are because of maybe the climate. Some of them we don't really understand. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions. Uh, Macklin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? I can, I can jump in. Um, are there many people living on the islands? And if yes, where are they from? Um, so there are people on the islands. Um, I don't know the specifics. There is a town on Santa Cruz. Um, I don't believe that's the only island with a town. Um, I don't particularly know the population. Um, I would have to Google it to find out. Um, but one thing I do know um, is you can't just decide that you're going to up and move to the Galapagos Islands. Um, the population is basically restricted to those folks um, that have been there for a long time. Um, originally before um, European colonization, um, the islands were uninhabited. So there are no pre-colonial inhabitants to the island. It's all post-colonial. Um, back in the day, the islands, once they were found, um, were a way station for privateers. Um, so that's how some of the original um, towns got founded on the islands. Um, and since that time, um, they've been tourist destinations. Great. Um, I am really interested to hear Jazz's question. Jazz, do you want to ask it? Uh, yes, uh, I read someplace that uh, 
when during an HMS Beagle visit, uh, they dined on the tortoises. Do, do people there, including tourists, eat those uh, creatures? Uh, no, those creatures are all protected. Okay. Um, and under extreme pressure. Uh, but yes, um, the tortoises were one of the reasons um, that boats, ships would reprovision back in the day. A tortoise is easy to capture if you have enough people because they weigh hundreds of pounds, five, 600 pounds, the big ones. Um, but if you store them, you can stack them basically in berths in the hull of a ship, the hold. Um, and if you stack them upside down, they will provide for fresh meat for more than a year with no food or water. Very good and uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and we won't ask you for recipes. Um, no, but snapping uh, Julie. is just as good. <laughs> mm, yum. Uh, Julie, do you want to ask your question? Julie's planning a trip, it sounds like. Maybe you can read it. No, Julie's unmuted, but okay. Um, Julie's preparing uh, to go to the Galapagos in early October 2021 and is wondering what preparation you'd recommend. Uh, for example, reading materials, what clothing best to wear, etc. cetera. Um, reading is good. Um, the climate is equatorial. Um, I think if you um, Google and um, you look up, I forget the exact site, but it's basically the main um, Galapagos site. Um, I think it's maintained by the research center, but I could be wrong. It's maintained by one of the, the nonprofits associated with the islands. Um, there'll be a bunch of information there. Um, I sort of remember the temperature as being roughly um, in the 80s, it could even be in the high 80s. Um, sunscreen, good idea. Hat, comfortable clothes, good shoes. Um, you'll want shoes that you can use um, to get wet, um, but you'll also want hiking boots. Um, some of the, you know, the coast is rocky and uneven. Some of it's sandy. Um, you'll probably want to go snorkeling at some point, be prepared for that. Skinny dipping in large groups is frowned upon. Um, in terms of books, I might have a couple. <laughs> so one is titled Wildlife of the Galapagos. Um, the authors are Fritter, Fritter and Hoskin. Um, wildlife of the Galapagos. And it's a good book um, if you're looking to identify um, many of those species. Another one is um, Galapagos, A Natural History by Michael H. Jackson. And that's gonna tell you more than you want to know probably about everything you can think about. Chris, you're muted. Yep, I think we've reached the end of our questions. Um, so let's all uh, give Gary another round of applause and thank you for putting that together for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. That was, that was you, fantastic. Gary. Good night, all. It was great, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.